everything dies. You, me, everyone on this planet, our sun, our galaxy, and eventually, the universe itself. This is simply how things are. It's inevitable, and I accept it. It all began with an idea. After the Kree Thrall War, Iron Man gathered together the greatest and most influential figures in the superhero community on Earth. They became the Illuminati, banding together in an effort to share information and collaborate against the biggest threats to their home. Though the group managed to have some limited success in their efforts, they ultimately disbanded and abandoned the idea. This all changed one day in the heart of the great nation of Wakanda. Black Panther and some loyal subjects discovered a pocket in the world that hid a point on Earth, which nobody could see within. Inside this pocket, the nation's leader made a startling discovery. Another Earth was heading towards this one, with a group of invaders closing in ahead of the other planet. The invaders were led by an unknown woman, and they began to set up a device. Black Panther recognized their language as one of the oldest known on Earth, High Sumerian but she quickly recognized their own English. The woman explains that she is Black Swan, and they are all in the middle of an incursion. Her order worships a being known as Raboom Alal, an impatient god with an endless appetite. She is here to destroy this world. A fight erupts and Black Panther's men are killed. The leader springs into action and defeats the invaders. Before the Wakandan can stop the Swan, however, she is able to destroy the earth where she came from. In an instant, the sky is returned to normal, and just as soon as it began, the event is over. The next day, Black Panther reforms the Illuminati, gathering Doctor Strange, Mr. Fantastic, Steve Rogers, Tony Stark, Black Bolt, and reluctantly, he even recruits his longtime enemy, Namor. Reed Richards interrogates the Black Swan and learns of the true nature of these events. Every universe exists along a timeline, from the explosive birth of each universe to its quiet heat death. All worlds are born and end along this timeline. We also know there is a multiverse, an infinite amount of Earths contained in an infinite number of universes, where an endless amount of possibilities exist. But everything dies. All universes head towards entropy and death. This is where the problem lies. Somewhere on one of these Earths, Something happened that caused the early death of one universe. This unnatural, untimely event caused the timeline of the entire multiverse to contract, ever so slightly. But this was enough to cause a chain reaction within the natural order of things. Now, one by one, the timelines are colliding. Two universes will collapse at an incursion point, and, critically, this event always takes place on Earth. If the two Earths touch one another, they will cause the destruction of both universes. This, in turn, will cause the multiverse to contract more and more until another incursion happens. The only way to stop the incursion is to destroy one of the Earths. This will save both universes and one Earth. Each incursion lasts exactly 8 hours. After this time expires, either both universes are lost, or one Earth must die. One event two possible outcomes. This was the trap of the incursions. This was the problem the Illuminati faced. Black Swan warns the Panther that death is inevitable. Incursions break men and their hope. It crushes what makes us decent and steals away what little honor we have left. It is the slow, unstoppable end to all things. Captain America is the most vocal member of the group who tries to get everyone not to panic at the situation. He refuses to believe that destroying worlds is even an option. Instead, he suggests they have a solution, they just need to be willing to use it. The Avengers agree to reassemble the Infinity Gauntlet, and in the process, they recruit the X-Man Beast onto the team as a replacement for the deceased Charles Xavier. Not long after that, Black Swan calls out to her god, Raboom Alal. Another incursion is here. 
The Illuminati meet and assemble the gauntlet. Captain America is actually successful at pushing the other universe away, thanks to the staggering power of the gems. But they were only meant to operate within our universe. The feat of preventing an incursion entirely is far too much for the gems, and the gauntlet is lost. The victory is devastating to our heroes. They may have stopped this incursion, but what about the next one, or the one after that? Their one and only solution is gone. Steve refuses to believe that they have to destroy other worlds to save their own, but the others are no longer convinced. As they begin to ponder possible solutions, Rogers knows where this is going. They will head down a dark path of being the lesser of two evils until they wind up becoming destroyers of worlds. These men will give up on everything they are just to survive, and Captain America wants no part in this. Frustrated, Tony reprimands his old friend. Why does he always have to be like this? He apologizes to Rogers and gives an order to Dr. Stange. In an instant, Steve is on the floor and his memory is gone. It all began with two men. One was life, one was death. With Rogers out of the picture, the Avengers reluctantly turned to recreating the Doomsday device that Black Swan used to destroy the world she came from. Tony is also set about building part of a Dyson Sphere around the Sun. The facility will harvest massive amounts of power from our star, allowing it to be used as a weapon if need be. Reed names it Soul's Hammer. Meanwhile, Doctor Strange knows he is outclassed among his more technologically oriented peers and begins to research dark magic in order to boost his power. Unfortunately, he and the others are interrupted by another incursion. None of the Avengers are ready at this time, but the Beast has an idea. Our Infinity Gems were used to stop an incursion, so perhaps this new world will have gems of their own. Lacking any other solution, the heroes agree to travel to this other world, even though it means one of them will have to stay behind. Namor laughs at this idea. It's time for hope to die. They need to embrace Oblivion, for they are already dead. On this other world, they discover this universe's Galactus is here, and is preparing to harvest the other Earth. Reed thinks he can stop the Devourer of Worlds, but the others are reluctant to act. Will this not solve their problem? They are greeted by Terax, herald of this version of Galactus. The herald led Galactus here to prevent the incursion, and claims to have used his cosmic knowledge to predict the event. The Illuminati decide they must stop this, even if it would save their world, and engage in a battle with the Herald. After a fierce fight, Terax is defeated, but Galactus successfully destroys the New Earth. They take the Herald prisoner and, getting desperate, agree to release the Black Swan. She tells them of her history. Once she was an innocent girl who lived a happy life, until the day the sky turned red. The Black Priest descended from their world to hers, they killed everyone except for her. The girl managed to escape to a special place called the Library of Worlds, where she was rescued by a group of women known as the Black Swans. They told her that her world was an offering to the great destroyer Raboom Alal. His mercy was a gift, and the girl accepted her new sisters. She was raised a Black Swan by the Black Swans. They taught her much, but access to the library was lost, and the Swans were scattered. Tony then asks what began the incursions. According to her, it was the birth of Raboom Alal, the Great Destroyer, that brought about the early death of everything. In a desperate attempt to live longer, the Black Swans offer up other worlds as a sacrifice. Daymore dismisses this all as a child's story, but the Swan seems to believe this unwaveringly. She knows of ways to survive an incursion, and she says she will help them but warns the men that they will have to do unspeakable things if they want to survive. They ask how long until another incursion, and Swan says it is mere minutes away. Sure enough, in a few moments, she says only two words, Raboom, Alal. The new Avengers detect another incursion. Re looks up the location for the event, and is devastated to discover it is happening above Latveria. The Illuminati show Black Swan their creation. They have successfully recreated the antimatter device that Swan used to destroy the world she came from. She declares this device to be a form of hope. It was a gift from Maboom Alal, and now they can enter the great struggle for life armed. With that, 
they teleport to Latveria with the bomb and enter the incursion point, directly above Castle Doom. Inside, Black Swan panics. The sky isn't red like a typical incursion, and is instead blue. This means the map makers are here. An army pours out of the sky from the other earth, and the Illuminati seen them locked in battle with Doctor Doom. They remark about how devastating this all is. Now Doom has seen everything. No doubt he will discover that the Illuminati were here too. But Black Swan says they are running out of time. The map makers are abominations that abuse the incursions for their own benefit. She takes them to the world where they came from and shows it is a dead planet. The map makers travel from world to world, harvesting its resources until the next incursion. With no other choice, and knowing the map makers will use the dead earth to invade their home, the Illuminati destroy the map maker world. It was an Avengers world. It was the first of many. Black Swan congratulates T'Challa for activating the device, but the Black Panther takes no pride in his actions. He remembers what they used to be, and knows what they are now. Silently, they look on at Doctor Doom, who watches the Illuminati carefully before the men teleport away. They return Black Swan to her cell, where she talks with their other prisoner, Terax. She asks if he misses finding worlds to destroy, and he admits that he does. So the Swan suggests they may have use for one another in the days to come. Back in Latveria, Doctor Doom's son presents his father with a remnant of the incursion. They say it fell from the sky. One month later, all has been quiet. Beast and the others spend time with Black Swan, learning from her what they can. Something, meanwhile, stirs in the city of Adelan, currently located high above New York City. Black Bolt is having his mad brother Maximus build an unknown device. Namor and Black Panther are struggling to prevent their two nations from going to war. And finally, Doctor Strange and Reed Richards are invited back to Latveria. Doctor Doom demands an explanation for the incursions, but Richards and Strange simply warn the tyrant that he should mind his own business. Meanwhile, the Illuminati have finished construction on an entire set of world-killing antimatter bombs. A week later, Iron Man returns from space. Reed asks how the excursion was, and Tony says nothing. Stark thinks back on his trip. He encountered the Watcher, who showed him the corpse of the living Tribunal. This being should not be dead, and is supposed to be the cosmic entity who rules over the entire multiverse. This entity should be one of the most powerful beings in creation, far above even the power of Galactus. Tony doesn't tell Richards any of this, but he says he now believes that everything is breaking down. For the tribunal to be gone, Tony believes that this world, this system, our galaxy, and even the fundamental underpinnings concerning all of reality seem to be under attack. Something must be done about this, and it's time to start being proactive. Meanwhile, in spite of the best efforts of Namor and Black Panther, war erupts between Atlantis and Wakanda. At the same time, while the Avengers are off-planet, fighting a sinister group known as the Builders, a massive, full-scale invasion of Earth begins. Thanos is here. Between the attack from Wakanda and the invasion of Thanos, Atlantis is almost completely wiped out. The Titan is invading Earth in search of his son. However, before the men can do anything about this, another incursion is detected. While Black Bolt is confronted in Adelan by Thanos, the rest of the Illuminati travel to Australia and prepare for the next incursion. Adelan is ultimately destroyed by the Black Bolt in a desperate attempt to stop Thanos. In Australia, the Illuminati are greeted by a being from another Earth known as an Aleph. Iron Man recognizes the Aleph as part of the Builder's army who are currently a major threat in the home universe, so they are reluctant to trust this being. In spite of this, they follow the Aleph to a special facility held high above the two worlds. Inside, they are greeted by other versions of the Builders. Meanwhile, Thanos and his forces successfully invade Wakanda. Inside, the Mad Titan is delighted to find that the new Avengers have been building weapons of global destruction. He comes across Black Swan and Terax, but looking over the two in silence, decides to leave them right where they are. The Builders explain that they once traveled between universes freely, but all that changed with the incursions. 
It is no longer safe to travel between worlds like this. These builders refuse to accept the death of everything, and have come to meet with the new Avengers, knowing the builders of this universe have just been defeated by their friends. The builders send the Illuminati home, and destroy the Earth they came from, ending the incursion. Their destructive device is too big to destroy the home of the new Avengers, but the builders leave them with one sentiment. If the Illuminati really want to survive, they should have destroyed their own Earth a long time ago. In the aftermath of the invasion, Doctor Strange embraces the need to empower himself with truly dark magic, while Thanos is imprisoned in Amber. Black Swan is unimpressed. The Illuminati fret over builders, but those people can hardly even move through the multiverse. She says that the map makers, their masters, the Ebony Kings, and the Black Priests are the true threat, and what is coming will be a true test for the new Avengers. The Swan has the Illuminati build a bridge, through this, they can observe how other worlds are combating the incursions. They find one world similar to their own, which is being invaded by the Black Priest. The Avengers and X-Men of this world are no match for these invaders. When Charles Xavier of this world tries to attack them telepathically, they easily resist his attacks, and Professor X is overwhelmed when he senses tens of thousands of minds within the Black Priest. They soon slaughter the other Earth's heroes, the priests then detect they are being observed and mock the Illuminati who are watching them. What hope is there when you oppose the Black Priests? What value does your life have? The next world they observe is no better. The map makers invade this earth in force and are able to call their masters, the Ebony Kings. The masters are able to instantly overpower the heroes of Earth, disrupting their enhanced genetics and killing their victims with ease. The Ebony Kings offer the remaining humans a chance to run. But these are Avengers. They attack the Masters, but are no match for these beings. Soon, only Doom remains, and in an instant, even he lays dead. They then observe what they can of Black Swan before she joined the Illuminati. They see that she helped another Reed Richards and Iron Man with their Earth until they were no longer of any use to her. Swan killed these two men, having led them into destroying everything they ever cared about, all in a desperate attempt to survive. Black Panther is also able to find a world that prevented two incursions in a unique way. This world features a band of heroes called the Great Society. During one incursion, the Society managed to defeat the map makers, and a hero named Norn was successfully able to use the magic to destroy the invading Earth. Other incursion the Great Society encountered was what was truly fascinating to Black Panther, as they were able to move their own planet out of phase, thus preventing the incursion entirely while saving both worlds. As Black Panther and Namor discuss this, and even manage to share a laugh together, they are shocked to discover that their observation technology is able to look into the future and find an image of themselves confronting the Great Society. Throughout all of this, the core Avengers team has also been greatly changing. At Iron Man's behest, the team of Earth's Mightiest Heroes has expanded its roster significantly, with a host of new members having been added to the team. Of note are the former X-Men known as Sunspot and Cannonball, as well as Hyperion, the only survivor of another Earth that experienced an incursion. Two beings who once served the Builders, known as Abyss and Ex Nilo, are also convinced to join the Avengers. As well, the mysterious Starbrand was given immense power and is guided by an enigmatic figure known as Nightmask. Together, these Avengers serve to protect the Earth from threats such as the Builders. One day, all this changed when the Watcher was murdered. A small group of villains managed to steal the being's eyes, and these organs were exposed to many of Earth's heroes. The eyes revealed secrets within the Marvel Universe. Two of these were critically important to the Avengers. First, Captain America got his memory back with regards to what was going on with the incursions. Second, Bruce Banner discovered that Tony Stark played a major role in his transformation into the Hulk. In response, Steve Rogers exposed the Avengers to what the Illuminati have been up to all this time, and declares the former heroes to be the Avengers' greatest enemies. Meanwhile, Tony has a major fight with Bruce, who is able to alter himself so that he retains his formidable intellect, even when transformed into the Hulk. The fight is settled when Tony invites Dr. Banner into the ranks of the new Avengers. Explaining everything and showing Banner what they've had to do so far, the Hulk becomes a part of the team in full. 
Soon enough, the next incursion begins, and as predicted, the new Avengers find themselves face to face with the Great Society. As both teams are composed of heroes, they greet each other amicably, and both sides experience a flicker of hope. The Great Society explains they were able to move a planet out of phase through the use of something called the Wishing Box, a device that works the same way as the Infinity Gauntlet. Like the Gauntlet, the box was destroyed after being used in this manner, and was thus also a one-time solution. Richards is devastated at this news, as it means that neither side has a peaceful way to end the incursion. But this incursion was not like the ones before. Both Earths are inhabited by innocent people. Both worlds have every right to live and neither side has a solution that won't destroy the other. Though both teams desperately try to come up with something, anything, it soon becomes clear what must be done, and Namor attacks the Great Society. A fierce battle erupts between two teams, but the Great Society is more than a match to the Illuminati. But one hero is more than ready for this battle. Doctor Strange unleashes his new powers and abilities. Soon, the entire society is overpowered by the Sorcerer Supreme, and one by one, the heroes are brutally killed. With nothing left to stop them, the Illuminati prepare to destroy this world. But none of the men are willing to cross this line. Black Panther volunteers, but when it comes to it, even he can't bring himself to do this. As Reed Richards comforts T'Challa, saying there is no shame in not being able to do this horrible thing, Namor takes the triggering device. The Atlantean reprimands his fellow Avengers. What is so important about their morality? How are their ethics above the lives of everyone on Earth? The truth is, they are nothing in the grand scheme of things. So Namor accepts his fate. He accepts who he is, and the opposing world is destroyed. T'Challa is enraged at this action and attacks Namor. The other Illuminati stop him, and each member departs, ashamed of their part in all of this. But the incursions aren't going anywhere, and Reed is devastated to learn that another one is on its way in only 8 hours. Collectively, the Illuminati are no longer able to keep this fight up. They choose to spend their last moments on Earth as they see fit, but as time runs out, they are shocked to discover that nothing has happened. They reconvene, wondering what happened to stop the incursion, only to realize that Namor is missing. Four hours ago, everything dies. You, me, everyone on this planet, our sun, our galaxy, and eventually the universe itself. This is simply how things are. It's inevitable, and I accept it. What I will not tolerate, what I find unacceptable, is going quietly like some mewling child before my time. There is something out there coming for us, trying to kill us all and I would do to it what it would do to us. Brothers, sisters, all the angels have fallen, and we devils are all that remain. So I ask you, will you help me kill worlds? Rise, the Cabal. Eight months later. The teleporter and Avenger known as Manifold arrives with Sunspot to greet Cannonball. A lot has changed over the many months, Sunspot has purchased the formerly villainous AIM and has made the company into a decent and well-meaning corporation. They are working with Thor, Hyperion, and the Zebra people who have populated a part of the Savage Land in an effort to build a portal. Ever since they have been informed of incursions, AIM and these heroes have been working non-stop to investigate this phenomenon. This portal will transport the two heroes far across the multiverse to the supposed place where all the incursions began. Meanwhile, an intruder is detected in Shield Station Golgotha, formerly known as the Avengers Tower. The intruder is Amadeus Cho, who is working with the Illuminati to steal some of Tony Stark's old tech. Tony is missing, but at least now Cho can recover his data for the former heroes, who are all now fugitives. Cho is nearly captured by Shield, but he manages to evade them, only to be stopped by the Avengers. In the end, he is interrogated by his captors. Cho is asked about the location of his comrades. Tony Stark, Bruce Banner, Hank Pym, Brian Braddock, Stephen Strange, Hank McCoy, T'Challa, and Black Bolt are all wanted by the law. Cho says he's not going to say a damn thing, but his interrogator says otherwise. He will talk. 
He will tell them where the Illuminati are hiding. He will tell them the location of her husband, Reed Richards. Meanwhile, Namor has a visit with Dr. Doom. He comes to Doom a broken man. In the eight months since we last saw him, Namor has come to accept that the Cabal is unmanageable. They destroy worlds with impunity like wild animals. They have destroyed Earth after Earth, saving scores of universes, but have come to love the atrocities they commit. They savor the slaughter and feast on death like gluttons, and are beginning to sense Namor's hesitation. He admits that he needs Doom's help, but the despot refuses him. Namor should have come to Doom first, not as a last resort. Not too long ago, Doom approached the Illuminati, but was refused. Now, he has other concerns. Doom's son, Kristoff, bids Namor well, and wishes him the best of luck with his genocide. Later, Kristoff asks why they couldn't have made Namor an ally. The incursions affect everyone, even the powerful Doom family. But the villain knows Namor, and sees that the man they had dinner with is not the great leader that he once knew. That Namor is gone replaced with a mere shell of what he once was. But Doom knows what must be done to face the incursions, and understands something far better than Namor ever could. Everything dies. It is then revealed that Doom has gathered together a massive team of the world's best minds, including the villainous Mad Thinker. Using the remnants from the incursion over Latveria, the scientists have been able to steal the Mapmaker's network and chart out the multiverse in his present form. Doom says he has a plan and everything he needs to make it come to be. With the Molecule Man in his custody, nobody can stand in Doom's way. AIM is eventually able to complete the portal, and a team is sent to confront whatever is causing the incursions. Led by Thor and Hyperion, Abyss, Starbrand, Nightmask, Ex Nilo, an entire group of powerful Ex Nili travel through the portal to an uncertain future. There's no coming back, but Thor only hopes he is worthy of such a glorious end. The Avengers later commence a raid on an Illuminati facility, only to find it empty. Hulk and Beast left a taunting message, saying they are always one step ahead of Steve Rogers. Steve is no longer Captain America after the super soldier serum within him was rendered inert, and he instead leads the Avengers from the sidelines. At this point, the incursions have become a matter of public knowledge. Terax even spoke to the UN, explaining the situation and how the Cabal protects mankind. Knowing full well that the Cabal commits atrocities so that humanity can live on, the collective nations of the world have largely turned a blind eye to their actions. Outside of the United States, S.H.I.E.L.D. is no longer welcome, while the President barely tolerates the hunt for the Illuminati. Two days later, Sue has a secret meeting with Reed. It is revealed that the two are working together, and that Sue is on the side of her husband. The family misses Reed, but the visit has to be short. Too many people are watching Sue, but before she leaves, she gives a message to Reed from their daughter Val. The note says that Reed can't win this fight, and it's time to start figuring out how not to lose. We then learn that Tony has been a prisoner of Black Swan for some time, explaining his absence from recent events. While the rest of the world stood by and watched, the Cabal has conquered and taken Wakanda, and the Golden City has fallen. Black Swan mocks Tony, and leaves him to rot in his cell, until Tony is surprised to find Black Widow and Spider-Woman have infiltrated the prison. They want to save Tony, but only if he needs saving. Stark admonishes his former teammates, saying that everything he has done is for the greater good. Realizing that Tony is too far gone, they leave him in his cell, in spite of Iron Man claiming to be the only one who can help stop all of this. Meanwhile, Doom is contacted by Valve, who gives him the same message she gave her father. You can't win, and it's time to find out how not to lose. But Doom is unconcerned. Her goals do not necessarily match his own. Doom then has a talk with Molecule Man, and both agree to do what they can to stop the destruction of the multiverse. Across the universe, in a void of nothing, Thor and Hyperion arrive with their army. They are attacked by the Black Priests, who prove to be formidable adversaries. Luckily, the team is able to figure out that the Priests are using language to sustain their power. Take away their words, and they lose their power. The Priests quickly lose hope against the Avengers, until their leader arrives. 
As the priests part to let him through, their leader greets Odin's son as a friend. He unmasks himself and is revealed to be Doctor Strange. In Latveria, Doom brings the remnants of the Mapmaker world to Molecule Man. He asks why it resonates at the same frequency as the all-powerful villain. Molecule Man says he will show Doom the answer, and the two villains disappear in a flash of blinding light. Doctor Strange takes his visitors inside and begins to explain what they are doing out here in a void of nothing. The Black Priests are trapped in a conflict they never wanted any part of. There is a war between two forces, the Ivory Kings and their map makers, and Raboom Alal. The two factions want the same thing, the destruction of everyone and everything. Thor asks his friend if he is the same man who was part of the Illuminati on his world, and whether or not the Black Priests are also responsible for destroying planets, as has been seen before. Strange says that he's not mistaken on either count, and that both of these things are true, but the Black Priests are misunderstood. They are the field surgeons of the multiverse, destroying Earth over and over again in an effort to save the entire corresponding universe. What they do is not murder, but triage. They believe they can stabilize the multiverse simply by destroying enough versions of Earth. Doctor Strange agrees to help them stop the incursions by seeking out the Ivory Kings and Raboom Alal. They agree to work together and flip a coin to determine who goes after which target. Meanwhile, Reed Richards deliberately exposes the Illuminati's location to Steve Rogers. Knowing it is a trap, the former Captain America orders S.H.I.E.L.D. to attack anyways, as this is a rare opportunity. The Avengers arrive with S.H.I.E.L.D.'s forces and do battle with the Illuminati. But the fight is short-lived when AIM and the remaining Avengers appear above S.H.I.E.L.D. forces and orders S.H.I.E.L.D. to stand down. A massive fight erupts as the three factions duke it out, until Reed Richards and Steve Rogers have a showdown. But Steve realizes all too late that he has been had, as every combatant suddenly finds themselves encased in a force field. Sue Storm emerges from the AIM vessel along with Medusa, Namor, and Black Bolt, and just as quickly as it began, the battle is over. Black Panther is outraged at the presence of Namor after all the Atlantean has done. But Reed insists that he needs T'Challa's trust right now, and they even manage to convince Rogers to give them five minutes of his time. However, he makes it clear that after what the Illuminati have done, there will be no forgiveness. This ends with everyone answering for what they have done. Namor says that he would do it all over again, and he did what he had to do. But he admits it was also wrong, and that he should have answered for his actions. The Atlantean vows that when all this is over, he will surrender and turn himself over for trial. The others agree to the same, all except T'Challa. Steve refuses to relent as in his eyes, Black Panther is as guilty as the rest of them. But Reed says they are meeting now because there is literally no time left. In little under two hours, there is going to be an incursion, and Namor has to make sure the Cabal are there when it happens. The Illuminati have prepared a shield that will trap the villains on the other world, dooming the Cabal to die along with the other Earth, which has been identified as a dead world. Two hours later, the Cabal gets ready to set out. Thanos is worried as Maximus has discovered that something is rendering the multiversal timeline to a point shorter than ever before. The incursion is with the Mapmaker world and the Cabal sets about with their usual slaughter. Namor slips away as the rest of the superheroes look on, until Sue realizes that T'Challa is missing. On board the orbital shields, Black Panther is waiting for the Atlantean's arrival. He has something for his old comrade, and stabs Namor in the chest with a ceremonial Wakandan dagger. The knife will not kill him, it's just where it belongs. Black Bolt then appears before Namor, and he is wished farewell. The two men activate the shield and fire the trigger, dooming Namor along with the rest of the Cabal. In an empty white void, Doctor Doom and Molecule Man emerge. The Molecule Manipulator creates raw material for Doom, who assembles a device. Molecule Man says the way is down. All the way down. Richards has a meeting with Steve and the other Avengers, and explains that recently, something has happened. Where there were once hundreds and thousands of universes remaining, now there are less than two dozen. The heroes are out of time. But there is some good news. They can't stop the incursions, 
but the current trajectory of the timeline suggests they only have to deal with one more. The last one. Steve asks what happens after the final incursion, and Reed says he has no idea. Rogers then asks if they actually have plans to do something about this, so the Black Panther goes through various ideas that they've tried already that have been given to them through the Black Swan. First, they tried to use the Cosmic Cube. They would prevent further incursions by blowing up their own Earth and moving the population to another planet. But many stars in the universe are dying of an early death, presumably as a result of incursions, and as a result, the cube was lost. They managed to get an audience with Galactus and the Celestials, and even made some progress with negotiations, until the cosmic beings simply disappeared. They sought the assistance of the Captain Britain Corps, but that ended in what is described as beyond disaster. Not even Franklin Richards could stop the incursions, and Reed was devastated at having to experiment on his own son. The conversation is interrupted when Richards notices that somebody is back. Almost eight months ago, Tony and Reed sent somebody across the universe in an attempt to find answers. He was only supposed to be gone a few weeks, so he was assumed lost forever. But now he's returned, and the yellow jacket appears through a portal. He says he was unable to find Rabu Malal, but he did discover the identity of the Ivory Kings, the White Lords from Wild Space, from out there, from beyond. The others are shocked to learn that the Beyonder belonged to an entire race of beings, but Hank Pym is certain about his discovery. These beings cannot be fully understood in a human fashion. The Beyonder from the Secret Wars was a child unit, a being who crunched a universe into a little ball just to make a toy. But the Beyonders are not playing some game. Hank Pym was sent to find the great destroyer Raboom Alal, but what he found was much worse. Hank explains what happened to him. He found a builder refugee network for those who lost their universe. Following them, he watched as they discovered the location of the Ivory Kings through their servants, the Map Makers. Brian Braddock then arrives at the meeting and fills in the rest of the story. About four months ago, the Captain Britain Corps began actively investigating the collapsing multiverse. Like the Builders, the Corps were eventually able to track down the Ivory Kings. But it was a trap. The entire Captain Britain Corps were wiped out, with only Brian, who was cast out at last minute, surviving the attack. The Builders experienced something similar, but they discovered the trap wasn't for them. The Beyonders had bigger enemies than mere mortals. It took a bit of time, but the Ivory Kings were able to wipe out an endless number of gods. The Celestials, and even the most powerful of cosmic entities, such as Eternity or the Inbetweener, were obliterated, until even the living Tribunal himself was killed by the Beyonders. The gods spent billions of years building something, only for these things to destroy it all on a whim. Six months ago, in the Ultimate Marvel Universe, this world's Reed Richards was invited to see the rebuilt headquarters of S.H.I.E.L.D. by Nick Fury. This version of Reed Richards became a villain for a time, setting himself up as something called the Maker and wiping out half of Europe. Nick Fury is bringing Reed onto S.H.I.E.L.D.s, ordering the former hero to prepare for every doomsday scenario the young man can dream of and do whatever it takes to stop them. In the present day, the Maker has set himself up with his sentient computer and has begun to combat incursions in the Ultimate Universe. By now, Richards has destroyed 67 worlds, and he remarks that he is getting too good at this. But the computer tells him that something has changed in the multiverse. Yesterday, there were hundreds and thousands of universes remaining. Today, there are less than two dozen. The Maker travels to the incursion point and instantly recognizes Blue to signify the presence of a Mapmaker world. Little does Ultimate Richards know, high above in the Mapmaker world, Namor finds himself knocked down. The Cabal see him fall and ask Namor what happened. He covers for himself, saying that he noticed something in the sky and went to investigate it, discovering that a shield generator is trapping them. Namor and Thanos both realize they are effectively doomed until they are shocked to discover a second incursion is happening at the same time as the first one. They rush to the second incursion point, and the Cabal escape to the third world. When they arrive, they are greeted by the Maker. Meanwhile, having been distracted with the earlier conflict with the Builders, the alien empires of the Prime Universe have finally taken note of the incursions. 
Many stars within this universe are dying an early death thanks to these events. And the incursions themselves mean that the entire universe could be wiped out at any moment. Knowing that the Earth is the focal point of this event, and even though the Avengers were instrumental in defeating the Builders, the Shi'ar, Brood, Skrulls, Kree, and Annihilus enter into an alliance and vow to destroy the Earth. Reed and Black Panther discuss plans for a solution to incursions. They can't win. These can't be stopped. But as Val said, it's time to focus on how not to lose. Together, these two created a lifeboat, a means for humanity to start anew on another world, while the Earth itself is inevitably destroyed. They have failed to save the world. They have failed to save any world. But at least they will be able to save the species. They receive a call from the Guardians of the Galaxy, who warns them of the approaching attack on Earth. The heroes say they are staying here and refuse to evacuate. Rocket Raccoon has only one thing to say about people who choose to go down with the ship. Idiots. On another world, the Black Priests discover Black Swans entering a door to the Library of Worlds. They summon their leader, Doctor Strange, and forcibly take the door. They enter, and Steven casts a spell to detect the way most traveled. The Order of the Black Swans are a religion, which means that this direction will be their place of reverence. The library is massive and beyond comprehension, but the Black Priests continue on to their destination. They come across a Black Swan, who directs them to a message. It says they are in a vacuum here, a void of silence. There are no words here. Strange realizes he is in a trap, and the swans obliterate the now powerless Black Priests. Steven is able to survive, but is overpowered and knocked unconscious. When he wakes, he is being taken to see Raboom Alal. Fane worship, no terror. Their master is merciless, and this is the path to oblivion. Strange approaches Raboom Alal, the great destroyer, who wishes to speak with the magician. He approaches the being, who says, In all the worlds, in all the universes, I would have never expected to see you here. Doctor Doom, Raboom Alal, the Great Destroyer, greets Doctor Strange. Doom built this religion with Molecule Man and his Oracle, but they are struggling against the Beyonders. After all, it takes a god to kill a god. In the remains of a shattered mapmaker world, the multiversal Avengers discover a dead drone. This is the tenth dead mapmaker they found. The acceleration of the death of the multiverse is ever rapidly increasing, and it is affecting everyone. Nightmask and Abyss are able to track down the location of the Beyonders. With Starbrand, they are able to open a portal to its location, but at a cost. Making such a connection causes Nightmask to revert farther and farther back to his primordial form. As the portal opens, Nightmask becomes younger and younger until he disappears entirely. The Avengers find themselves in darkness until a massive white portal opens in front of them. They hear a voice. We are beyond. Dreamers. Destroyers. All of reality are whim. Who dare stand before us? Thor answers and claims they are the best of gods and men. They are Avengers. Two Beyonders emerge through the portal and warn the Avengers to run or face destruction. Thor strikes at one of them, but he easily regenerates attack and fires a massive wave of energy at the Avengers. The ex Nili and Abyss move in. These beings create and change life. They evolve it into something different, something better. So they surround a Beyonder and begin to reshape it just as they've reshaped many worlds before. The Beyonder is changed and altered, becoming a massive celestial tree, while the Nili and Abyss disappear. The other Beyonder is furious. He attacks Thor, Hyperion, and Starbrand, the last Avengers standing. Starbrand is impaled in his chest. He never wanted any of this. He just wanted a normal life. And here, in the end, he can't even contain it. His powers become unstable, and Starbrand explodes, destroying himself along with the second Beyonder. Hyperion can't believe it, but they won. They defeated two Beyonders. But their victory is short-lived. More are coming. Much more. The two heroes realize they are going to die here today. 
They share a last laugh together, and Hyperion says that Thor made his dark life a little bit lighter. Thor calls Hyperion his brother, and they race off to make their final stand. Against the bleak nothing of dead space, two gods fell to many. The sun shone one last time. There was lightning and thunder, and then silence. Back on Earth, the Illuminati return to Wakanda. With the Cabal no longer occupying this place, they find Tony still imprisoned here. They aren't sure what to do with him. Tony says he has lost everything just like them. He has fallen just like them. But he will not die in this cage and demands that his life be given for something, anything. So T'Challa frees Iron Man and tells him to go and die well. These are the days for it. The fleet of alien warships close in on Earth, but the Avengers have a major resource that Tony has built during all of this chaos. He designed an automated system to control a massive, planet-killing ship captured during the Builder War. AIM has also been working tirelessly and has built an orbital satellite system to attack the oncoming fleet of ships. Using these weapons, a massive battle begins in the space surrounding Earth. Things are going well until the AIM facility overloads and the weapons stop working. The alien Armada then unleashes the Annihilation Wave, and the planet killer is destroyed. All hope seems lost, but the Illuminati have been working away at another solution. They phase a rogue planet to take Earth's place, while Tony activates Soul's Hammer. Across the multiverse, we learn where Molecule Man took Doctor Doom. They went to the beginning of the universe, and then to the Great Library, where Molecule Man informed Doctor Doom of the Beyonders. These beings are conducting a grand experiment, and were planning to cause the simultaneous death of everything in the multiverse. And the Molecule Man is their bomb. Like everybody else, there are many versions of Doom, but each of them are all slightly different. But there is only one Molecule Man. He was constructed as a single entity, a shared consciousness existing in every possible realm. Molecule Man is the bomb, and when he dies, the universe goes with him. The Beyonders want to see what happens when every bomb goes off at once. So Doom must stop this. This version of the Molecule Man will die in only 25 years, detonating every other version of him in the multiverse. Before that, a lot of other versions of him are going to have to die. Even Doom is unsure if he can accomplish such a task, nor if he even believes it. But Molecule Man says he will soon see real results of his work. Once he reaches a high enough threshold, the incursions will begin. And if he has any chance of success, he's going to need to start a religion. If Doom fails, everything and everyone dies. If he is successful, perhaps it will not. Doom must remain anonymous in order to protect himself. Too much relies on him. Victor will have to find purpose in killing the same man over and over again, but finding Molecule Man in each universe will be even more difficult. If he cannot be found, the Manifold, a teleporter seen in many different worlds thus far, can also be used to the same effect. And so Doom sets about on his great quest. In five years, Molecule Man ridiculed his companion. Only a thousand versions of him have been killed so far. When are they gonna get to billions? When are things gonna start smashing together? Two years later, the first incursion occurred. A year after that, Doom found his first disciple, a swan. One became three, and soon the swans grew into an army. With them, their actions and feats grew until they were the order of the black swans. Ten years of killing Molecule Men and the Beyonders finally noticed that something was wrong. They created the map makers and began to chart out worlds where Molecule Man had died. And so the world began between the Ivory Kings and Raboom Alal, as reality collapsed around them. Until now, Doom finishes telling this tale to Doctor Strange. Stephen asks about the Black Priests. Though he came to lead them, Stephen doesn't actually know about their origin. Interestingly, neither does Doom, but he speculates that the Black Priests were a type of natural defensive reaction by the multiverse. Steven then asks about the Black Swan on their Earth, who acts quite differently than the order Doom describes. But this is the nature of religion, 
Splintered factions and those who bastardize the faith may turn to the same behavior and goals as the Beyonders, the death of all things. But this was not Doom's will or intention. Victor then gathers his black swans in a massive device. He believes he has finally found a way to oppose the Beyonders. Steven asks what is the point of all of this, and Doom says, Would it be worth it if they could save something? Anything? So Doctor Strange agrees, and at the edge of the universe, where Thor and Hyperion made their last stand, the portal is opened once more. Doom challenges the Beyonders and activates his device, but it crumbles before the might of the Beyonders. The three men are engulfed in a bright white light, and then there is silence. It is then revealed that this is the event that allowed the Beyonders to activate the Molecule Men. At once, reality is decimated as hundreds of thousands of universes are reduced to the two dozen remaining without Molecule Men in them. This is how time ran out. It all began with two men. Months ago, they sat at a diner. Tony wanted to explain himself to Steve and just wanted his old friend to listen. Stark doesn't understand. Why does it matter what the Illuminati are up to when the Cabal are loose doing God knows what? But Rogers says that they are no different from the Cabal. And Tony says this is the heart of the problem. Steve really and truly sees Tony as a villain now. So Stark says that he should take a closer look at their waitress. Her name is Tamara and she used to be host to Captain Universe. Tony found her daughter. He still cares and Steve is reminded that his friend still worries about the important things. Rogers asks if they are really going to find some way out of this and Tony is sure he can. But Tamara says that Tony is lying. Captain Universe re-emerges in her and blows the two heroes back. She admonishes Tony. There is no great machine of salvation. Nothing Tony built will last. She is dying. The universe is dying. We all are. And Tony has known this all along. In the present day, the last Avengers stand before the might of the universe's alien forces. It is the end of days. Tony activates Soul's hammer, and the alien fleet is nearly completely destroyed in one fell swoop. The Illuminati phased Earth back into normal space. Iron Man did it! He saved them all! Just in time for the apocalypse. In the Ultimate Universe, the Maker calls Nick Fury and Hawkeye to a technologically advanced city that appeared overnight. Both men are understandably worried, and ask for an explanation for all of this. So this version of Reed Richards tells them of the incursions and prepares them for a demonstration. They take Fury and Hawkeye to an incursion site and Reed destroys the other world, showing the severity of the situation. As of this incursion, only two worlds remain. The ultimate and original Marvel universes are the last two standing. And on the other side in the original universe lie the greatest heroes Thanos has ever known. The Titan states that if they want to survive, they must be prepared to kill them all. Nick Fury recognizes what's coming and decides he's going to die on his feet with a gun in hand. He prepares S.H.I.E.L.D. for war and they get ready for the final incursion. In Earth 616, Black Panther visits the White House. He says that later today, the world is going to end. They will be assembling a team of the world's best minds in the hopes of somehow surviving and restarting the human race. But people need to know when their time is running out. They need to hear it from somebody they trust. Everyone is going to die. There's no escaping or avoiding it. The staff are furious and admonish T'Challa. The heroes were supposed to save everyone, but Black Panther says there's no saving any of them. They were never going to save this world. They never stood a chance. Over at the Baxter building, Richards prepares the lifeboat. The Avengers agree that most of the Illuminati are too valuable for the human race to lose in spite of all that they have done, but Banner and Captain Britain are voluntarily opting out. Pym is also too unstable to go, and there's only one person everyone is contentious about letting on to the boat. Tony Stark. He's the most valuable engineer on the planet, but even James Rhodes is unsure if Tony is still the man he once knew. Steve ultimately shuts down the debate. Under no circumstances will Rogers let this happen. Reed agrees, and everyone sets about their one final task on Earth. Tony Stark is working one of his facilities until multiple war machine drones are detected. Tony armors up and prepares for battle, expecting Rhodey, 
only to find an armored Steve Rogers. If this is the end of the world, Captain America has one final task. But Tony mocks Rogers. He's gonna fight him in armor that Stark designed himself? But sure enough, a battle begins. Steve says the two of them are finished as friends, now and forever. He doesn't even know what Tony is anymore. His whole idea of expanding the Avengers, it was all just a distraction. Tony knew it was all a lie. He knew there was no stopping this. But Rogers wants to hear it. He wants Tony to admit this was all nonsense. He smashes Tony in the face with his shield and begins to tear apart his armor until Stark finally gives in. He admits it was all a lie. He knew the whole time and told no one. They're all duped. But do you know what Tony would have done differently after all this destruction and death? Not a damn thing. It started with two men. One was life, and one was death. And one always wins. Everything dies when time runs out. They're called the Beyonders. They are dreamers, destroyers. All of reality is their whim. Who dares stand before them? Only Doom. The multiverse is dying. Only two universes remain. Today, Earths collide. In the Ultimate Universe, Nick Fury contacts the Ultimate Reed Richards, also known as the Maker. The final incursion is here, and the Ultimate Universe is ready. They aren't going to risk death, so S.H.I.E.L.D. is preparing a preemptive strike on the Marvel Universe. They're going to send everything. Everything they've got. On the other side of the incursion, the 616 Universe is also getting ready for a fight. S.H.I.E.L.D. and an army of heroes are gathered together, and a battle begins. New York City is attacked. But don't worry, Spider-Man's got this. Uh, maybe? Meanwhile, in the Baxter building, a lifeboat is being prepared. If this is indeed the end times, then the 616 Reed Richards will at least be able to preserve the human race. Black Widow is gathering the world's most able minds and important people in the hopes that humanity will survive all of this. Outside, a battle rages on. The heroes struggle against the ultimate forces until two sentinels arrive. All this time, the X-Men have been well aware of the problem regarding incursions, but until now, Cyclops has largely been sitting on the sidelines. But Scott has been preparing his own solution to the problem, and the X-Men join the Avengers in defending their world. A team of the two factions travel to the Ultimate Earth, where they attack the Triskelon, this version of the S.H.I.E.L.D.'s headquarters. Together, they are able to topple the building. But now it is the Maker's turn to enter the fray. He unleashes a fleet of highly advanced weapons as they make a devastating attack on Earth-616. From a safe location, a team of villains look on. With little else to do, Wilson Fisk is hosting a party where they shall drink with joy at their hero's greatest failure. Until they hear a voice. Gentlemen, they say that when you die, you can't take it with you. Which begs the question, exactly what am I going to do with all these bullets? In the city streets, Black Widow's ship, escorting a team destined to save the human race, is tragically destroyed in an instant. It's time. There's little else to do. Black Panther and Reed activate a device which is connected to the teleporting hero known as the Manifold. The heroes that are to be saved are teleported to the life raft. Many are brought on board, including Spider-Man, Star-Lord, and Captain Marvel, while others, like the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy, are left behind. There is no space. There is no time. The Sentinels are struggling to hold off the Ultimate Forces. Cyclops decides it's time to activate his master plan. The Phoenix Egg is ready to hatch. There you are, old friend. Remember me? Remember how this feels? It's love. The life raft sets off, 
while the phoenix rampages outside until Scott Summers suddenly finds himself aboard the raft with the others. The heroes settle in as they take off, but as they do, the incursion is closing in on the raft and a bolt of lightning causes a massive hull breach on the vessel. A chunk of the ship is blown off, and inside are a number of heroes, including the rest of the Fantastic Four. Reed and T'Challa prepare to rescue them, but it's too late. The Invisible Woman is unable to sustain a shield around the debris, and everyone on board rapidly dissolves into nothing. Reed is devastated, but the heroes have no time for grief. They rush to escape the incursion, and as worlds collide, everything dissolves into a bright white light. My entire life, I believed in better days ahead. I believed in tomorrow. I hid that belief in my heart, a stronghold against a world that devours hope. But now the walls have fallen, I have been overrun, and I hope, I believe, in nothing. In the beginning, there was nothing, followed by everything, swirling, burning, specks of creation that circled life giving suns. God Doom created the light. Then there was Earth. The firmament cooled and he raised up a land, this holy land, the world, and upon it, he set his kingdoms. In the kingdom of Utopolis, a small ragtag band are investigating seismic activity in the area, but instead have found the remains of a strange vessel that is not from this world. They plan to dig it out for further study. Doomguard, today. Many will try, but one will be chosen to wield the hammer of gods. He has been chosen. But before he can begin his lessons, he, along with his brothers and sisters, must honor their god of doom. The young one is told that his order is to police the kingdoms of their god. The order has jurisdiction over all. One baron has fallen out of the grace of their god, and they are now tasked to bring him in for trial. The new wielder of the hammer now travels with the elder one to the kingdom of Bar Sinister, who is ruled by its baron. Entering the throne room, the elder, with conviction, orders Baron Sinister to stand trial for his crime of discord. But the Sinister is unmoved and plays it coy. He asks if he even has the right guy. But they came with orders from the Maker, and Baron Sinister reluctantly hands himself over. Doomstud, where a world-eating sentinel stands guard over Castle Doom, where the High Court convenes, and where God Doom himself sits in judgment on his throne, Idrisil, the World Tree. Baron Sinister, finding a way to be released with a clean slate and in accordance with the laws of Doom, challenges a fellow Baron to trial by combat. Jamie Braddock stands ready, but it is not he who Sinister wants, but instead, the younger brother Brian has been chosen. The battle commences and Brian takes the first strike to decapitate the Sinister One. Brian believes himself the victor, but any battle against Baron Sinister is not so easily won. Sinister's body rolls up and knocks Brian to the ground. He reclaims his head and strikes a death blow to Brian, but suddenly, his weapon is neutralized by their maker. Doom orders everyone to their knees. King Doom cares not for the bickering of Barons, but instead, he brings news of heretics, rebels, non-believers residing in Baron Braddock's kingdom of higher Avalon. Once brought forth and tortured for information, these rebels manage only one name, Braddock. King Doom demands to know the location of the hidden citadel that houses these heretics from Brian. But the young Braddock doesn't know, in which case, Doom finds Brian guilty for the sins of the people of higher Avalon. But the truth comes out, Jamie Braddock has claimed knowledge of the rebels and pleads for mercy for his brother. Jamie is taken away for his crimes against their maker, and Brian is elected as the new Baron succeeding his brother. Moments later, while conversing with Sheriff Strange, Valeria brings forth newfound information about a crashed site. The material on the ship does not match anything that they have available, but is still in the realm of possibility. Her interest is put to an end by the Sheriff, who states that this is Sism. Sheriff Strange orders Valeria's researchers to abandon the site. It is now quarantined. Elsewhere, on top of the wall known as the Shield, Jamie Braddock is sentenced, but before his sentencing is passed, the Elder Thor presents him with armor and weapon. He takes on his sentencing with honor and leaps forth. His sentencing awaits. 250 feet later, Jamie finds himself in the Deadlands. 
His battle for survival begins as a venom creature stands ready to consume his flesh. But Jamie is a warrior and he will not go down so easily. But how will he fare against an army of abomination? Or the seasonal migration of the drone army that is the Annihilation Wave? Both of which pales in comparison to the damned Ultron AI, self-replicating super-evolving automatons that systematically try to break containment every generation. Hours later, young Thor and the Elder reports back to Sheriff Strange. The deed is done and Jamie Braddock is sentenced. But their task is not done yet. They now head off to secure and quarantine the crash site. Arriving on location, the Thors watch as a researcher stands in amazement. He falls to his curiosity and lays hands on the vessel. A loud gush of wind erupts from the ship and the hull is opened. The Thors rush towards the researcher, but a spear launches out of the hull and straight into the Elder's abdomen. He yells at the young one to return to the sheriff and inform him that they have found death. The Elder readies his hammer as lightning pours out of it, but he is not fast enough as more objects are thrown into his flesh. Who is it that dares defy the Maker's justice? It is the Cabal, and they have arrived at a very strange place. Thanos grabs the researcher and demands to know where they are. He demands for a name. Trembling in front of the Mad Titan, the researcher states, This place? The Highborn calls it Latverion. Believers calls it God's Kingdom. But everyone else, we common folk, we call it something else. We call it... Castle Doom. Sheriff Strange is giving his weekly report to the God King. No major incident has occurred from the shield in the last week. There have been a few minor skirmishes in the kingdoms. Inferno smolders as usual. The green north rages. And there are scattered reports of a traveler illegally crossing mutant borders. While Strange discusses the building tension between Higher Avalon and Baron Sinister, Doom interrupts him. The king wants to know why Steven even bothers with this trivial nonsense. Strange insists that Doom is all-powerful, but not all-knowing. This is the last world, and they can't risk anything happening to it. But Doom remains unconcerned. Steven is frustrated and reveals that he remembers the world like it once was, and not just how it is now. Doctor Strange remembers everything, and how he could have been God instead of Doom. Victor reminds Steven that he refused this job and Doom had to take it. But Strange says it all just serves to remind him of the importance of their task. If Battleworld falls, all of reality goes with it. So Strange pays close attention to the unknown, for the unknown is their greatest threat. Doom simply restates that he is not worried about this and has full and complete faith in his sheriff. Strange thanks Victor for his kind words and the faith his friend bestows in him. As they move on to other matters, the Sheriff suddenly gets a call about some foreboding news from Doomguard. Later, in the Kingdom of Utopolis, Strange arrives to investigate the Cabal's crash site. They come across a dead Thor and spot the Cabal's tracks leaving the area. The Sheriff sends the Thors to track the fugitives down while he opens the vessel. The magician detects a presence inside the ship and demands that it reveal itself. Miles Morales, alive and well, emerges from the ship. Miles explains how he sneaked aboard during the final incursion, but Strange stops him quickly, shocked to learn that Miles remembers the world as it once was. Back at Castle Doom, Victor comes across Sue Storm, who is watching over her children as they are playing with the castle's Galactus. The two discuss things. Doom tries to reprimand her for leaving the castle without protection earlier, but Sue chastises Victor for forgetting that the woman can turn herself invisible and defend herself if needed. Doom apologizes and the two turn their attention to Johnny Storm. This world's human torch was unhappy with Doom ruling Battleworld and tried to ferment dissent. Victor left his punishment with Sue, who decided that rather than have him sent beyond the shield, it would do her brother more honor to become Battleworld's son. 
High above, Johnny now burns in orbit around Battleworld, providing light and heat for the sole planet in existence. This leaves the man in agony, but at least it is a place of honor, and now the people worship him. Doom then comments how he has changed himself, and in spite of Susan's encouragement, Victor states that he feels like a poor god. Doom admits he is still flawed and can't even heal his own face. But Susan encourages Doom, saying that she chose him not because of his looks, but for his mind and his heart. She has Victor take off his mask so that all may see what she sees, a god with great love for his people. We next go to the hidden island of Agamotto, to Strange's Sanctum Santorum. This is a safe haven from a world of prying eyes, and to remember all that has been lost. Strange takes a young version of Thor and Miles to a new vessel, similar to the one Miles came to Battleworld in. The young Thor opens this craft, and from it, the surviving 616 heroes emerge. Miles and Peter are utterly shocked, but glad to see one another while Carol Danvers asks what is going on. Doctor Strange has trouble at first confirming these really are the same 616 heroes that he once knew, until Cyclops emerges from the vessel, still powered by the Phoenix. Next, Black Panther and Reed Richards emerge, but Mr. Fantastic is still devastated from the loss of his family. Doctor Strange warns the heroes that the situation is very complicated right now, and quite different from the world they left. The heroes have been in stasis for eight years. Everything died, but in that moment of death, Doom created a new world, built from the remnants of collapsed worlds and cobbled together into one remaining planet. Battleworld has been all that existed during this time. Steven reveals that he found the 616 heroes three years ago, but left them in stasis. He says that he needed to consider things and didn't know quite what was going to be on board. Outraged, Reed demands a better explanation, but Doctor Strange only says that Doom has been very, very good at playing God. Back in the Kingdom of Utopolis, the Cabal discuss their new surroundings. Maximus is fascinated by this place, as the sun appears to orbit the planet, not the other way around. The others are frustrated and insist they should have questioned the Thor at the crash site, but as Thanos looks up, he is certain they don't need to go anywhere for answers. The Thors are here. On the hidden island of Agamotto, the remaining heroes of the two Earths are educated on the ways of this new world by Sheriff Strange. He tells them that their assumptions were correct, that there was something or someone behind the incursions. Unfortunately, no one could stop the perfect annihilation plans that the Beyonders had put in motion. Even Doctor Strange turned and ran when he looked into the dark abyss that was the Omnipotence. Doom did not. Doom saved all that was left to save, and they killed their foe and took their powers for themselves. Doubt him if you want. Defy him. Curse his very existence. It matters not. Doom reigns supreme. Long may he wear his crown. Cyclops, with the entire powers of the Phoenix Force, stands ready to challenge Doom's reign, but Strange objects, then suddenly, a hammer of a Thor begins to glow. Strange now sees that their attention is needed elsewhere. The Kingdom of Utopolis, a battle rages on as the Thor Corps takes on the Cabal. Two Thors are heavily wounded, and the Corps knows that they are losing. A Thor, using his hammer, signals the alarm for help, but this unnatural melee requires more than their army of Thors. This requires the attention of Doom himself. The Thor strikes with lightning, and one Thor vanishes from the fight, only to reappear in front of Doom himself. He informs his god and creator that they are losing two unknown heretics that would threaten Doom's reign, but the All Father does not take this information lightly. He marches towards the chamber of the All Seeing. From here, Doom can watch his world in the comfort of his own home. The chaotic battle displays right in front of him, Thor vs Cabal, but when Valeria asks her father what he sees, God Doom says that he sees mortals fighting mortals. Nats that do not concern him, but Valeria points out the fact that the multiple versions of this heretic are known to the court, but none of them shows the fearful amount of power that this one displays. Even Susan Storm points out that her force field cannot withstand more than a few blows from a Mjolnir, but these rebels are standing strong as their fields repel the weapon of the gods. 
As the court watches the battle unfold, a portal opens up which causes the Cabal and the Thors to halt their battle for a brief moment. Sheriff Strange has arrived with company. The heroes engage the Cabal and still, the court watches on. Valeria has researched these familiar heroes many times before, as she has concluded that the analogs all share something familiar and constant, but these fighters are somehow different. At this time, even Doom notices something familiar about these heroes, but then one person catches the Allfather's eye. Doom has spent some time scouring each kingdom looking for a version of this man, but to no avail. Reed Richards doesn't exist in any of the kingdoms, but here he is. In a flash of light, Doom appears in the epicenter of chaos. Everybody stands in awe as a new player enters the battlefield. Doom has arrived and he has words for his old foe. Richards, he screams. Mr. Fantastic berates his old enemy and what he did, but Doom will not be scolded by anyone. He saved the unsavable in the face of total annihilation. Their conversation gets interrupted by another alpha dog. Thanos approaches and accuses Doom of being a false god. If one plays at being a god, one would not shy away from saying it. Doom only has one reply. I am God. Doom attacks with his fury and the ground opens up to swallow anything in his path. After showing his might, he informs his old rivals that he is God in this new world and God is merciful. Readjust your old way of thinking, then you will bend your knee and bow your head at my feet, he states. But an overwhelming heat force shakes him to the bones. All he can do is defend while a voice states, I do not need your mercy. Things change, they evolve. The future cannot be denied. Cyclops, with the fury of the phoenix, stands tall. In the end, you are just a man. I am a mutant. I am the future in the present. And all the worlds, even yours, belong to us. This world is my... Before Summers could finish his sentence, Doom grabs the X-Men by the neck and in his hands he snaps it. Cyclops' lifeless body falls to the floor but only one man stands in the audience. During the battle between God and the Phoenix Force, Sheriff Strange has sent the Cabal and the surviving heroes to the wind. He knows that none of them will bend the knee, which is a death sentence. Strange will not be a part of that. Some of those heroes Strange has spent a lifetime with, some he calls friend. Doom demands for the heroes to be sent back, but Strange stands firm on his decision. You will not test me, Doom states, but Strange now sees something he never saw before. He now sees that Doom is still scared of his old foe, Reed Richards. Even with all of his mighty powers, Doom is still scared. He states, well you know what, old friend? I think you should be. The Allfather Doom will not stand any form of insubordination, not even from his second in command, from a man he called friend. Before the worlds, there was the ether. We cannot call it heaven, or forever, or any other joyful thing, for it was nothing. And in this ocean of absence, there was only God Doom and his first disciple our fallen leader, Stephen Strange. Think on it, brothers and sisters. There was nothing. And then, there was everything. And the only witness to the miracle of creation, besides the All-Father himself, was the good Sheriff Strange. What an honor! What a life! If Valhalla is for the brave, Stephen, then you will be their king. Of all of us, you are truly the most worthy. At the funeral, Susan tells Doom that memorials will be held for Steven all over Battleworld. But the good sheriff was Victor's son, and they thought he would appreciate a more personal affair. Doom thanks Susan, while Franklin Richards flies up to the statue of Steven. He says that he is sorry that Strange died, as he liked the man a great deal, and vows that when he finds out who did this, he's going to smash them into little pieces. While Susan is surprised at these words, Doom looks on in silence. Hours later, he still stands watch until Valeria interrupts him. She offers condolences to her father, and Doom says we all deserve a better fate than death. Valeria then asks something that is bothering her, as she is confused as to how people escape the judgment of God. Doom explains that he is emotional right now, and that if he acts, his unspeakable power could break Battleworld. But Valeria is still unsatisfied. She needs to know more, asking just what happened out there that could have left Steven dead and Doom so placid. Her father pauses, 
before saying that undying love for family and eternal patience are not the same thing, warning his daughter not to confuse them. He asks if she can find those who escaped from the incident without asking more questions, and she affirms that she can as she leaves to follow God's orders. Doom looks on at Stephen once more, before cursing his name. He opens a portal and walks into an empty void. He comes before Owen Reese, the Molecule Man. The strange one-time villain is hungry. Every molecule in his body starves for more, even after feasting on all of reality. But Doom didn't bring food, as he has other things on his mind. He tells Owen that Stephen Strange is dead, which surprises his old friend. Reed guesses it was cancer, as it's always cancer. But Doom clarifies that Stephen fell to a different sort of decay. It was doubt that killed the good sheriff. Owen finds this interesting, as Strange knew. He was there when everything died. He saw it for himself. But Doom corrects him. He was there at the end, but even Victor wasn't there for the beginning. At first, it was just Owen and the Beyonders. The Molecule Man states that's not true. It all began with the Beyonders alone. They built whole universes, random ideas to be tested and given form. They pushed life as far as it could go, and then they got bored. They took an interest in the idea of death, and thus created the Molecule Man. A living, sentient bomb, one man, split and seeded all over reality to kill the multiverse. But the Beyonders forgot that every man has a choice, and Owen chose Doom. Together they formed the Order of the Black Swans and began killing Molecule Man across the universe, until the incursions began. So the two men came up with a new plan. A new bomb. A better bomb. A better Owen Reese. With Stephen Strange joining them, they stood before the Beyonders. They stole their powers and kept it somewhere safe, and used it to preserve what little remained of the multiverse. But it was too much for Stephen, who couldn't handle choosing what lives and what dies. He passed the responsibility over to Doom, and that was the day he became a god. And now Stephen is dead, which Doom admits was his own doing. But Owen already knows this. He could smell the guilt all over Victor. Owen thinks that everything is about to unravel. As Doom leaves, Reese wonders who will die next, knowing that if Doom goes, Battleworld dies with him. But if Owen dies? Well, wouldn't that be exciting? Elsewhere, Valeria has gathered together the Future Foundation's Justice Division. Their members are Nostradamus, Alex Powers, Dragon Man, Bentley 23, Night Machine, and Psycho Man. She tells her team that God has a job for them, and that their first and only priority is to find the team that has escaped into Battleworld. She orders all other projects to be suspended. There will be no more deep diving into the negative zone that exists deep within Battleworld. No more cataloging objects of great power. And, in spite of his protest, Bentley is specifically ordered to suspend all his little experiments south of the shield. Using specialized equipment, the team goes over what little they know. They were able to find the scene of the crime, using spikes in the relative energy levels of Battleworlds. Stephen Strange was always different from the rest of the energy that exists on this planet. While all beings of this world give off similar energy to that of Doctor Doom, Stephen always registered on the negative side, as an absence of Doom. This negative energy spiked before his death, implying that it was Steven who scattered the fugitives away from Doom. What this could mean worries the Future Foundation, who think this involves something much more sinister than simple mind control or coercion. So Valeria gives them her orders. They're going to take this all the way to the end of the line, no matter where it goes. She'll handle any noise from the throne, but for now, what they learn stays with them. Valeria wants to know what really happened, who these people are, where they disappeared to. She wants to know what they're capable of, and more than anything else, they have to find out what these fugitives want, and why it scares God so badly.
Castle Doom. It has been three weeks since the death of our beloved Sheriff Stephen Strange. God himself meets with his chief science officer, aka his daughter, Valeria. The daughter did her best, but she is nowhere closer to finding the rebels that are accused of murdering God Doom's hand. Even the bodies of Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight, brought to them by Baron Apocalypse, still does not yield any answers. The Black Swan joins their meeting and corrects the daughter of God. These two are husband and wife, she states. They are the surviving members of the Black Order, the generals of the tyrant, Thanos. Through the Swan's memory, we discover that after the great battle, everyone was scattered, but the Black Swan made her way to Castle Doom. And now, she feels at home. Hours later, the Foundation, Valeria contacts her team. She informs them that something isn't right. She feels like she is being lied to. The subject changes as Alex informs her of a breakthrough. They finally found the source of God Doom's power, and Valeria is standing on it. The news does not end there as her team continues to inform her on more strange drones found in their land. Six more. Further studies suggest that these drones are looking for something. Valeria can't help herself but wonder. Who is building these things? Somewhere inside Battleworld, the drones have come home to their maker, Reed Richards, one from the 616 reality and the other from the Ultimate Universe. These drones have been instrumental in collecting data. They now have a better understanding of this strange world and the full capabilities of Victor Von Doom, who now calls himself a god. The maker has set loose one of his projects, who he calls the Prophet. This man has gathered non-believers that grew into an army, a legion of doom deniers who now marches towards his throne and the world tree. The Maker seeks a plan to kill their foe, but Reed is not ready to consider that yet. Our problem as I see it, is determining how Victor Von Doom came to possess such power. Reed Richards, our hero from the 606, has a plan and he already got his best people working on it. Castle Doom, Miles Morales and Peter Parker arrives at the spot indicated to them by a device created by Reed Richards. They found the exact spot but nothing is here, except a statue. It could be underground. Actually, there's a trap door. Valeria pops out behind the shadows. I found it earlier. You're looking for the source too, aren't you? Parker is shocked, but no spider sense. They are not in danger. He knows this kid, but things are different here, and Valeria has no clue as to who he is. When asked if she is coming with them, she tells the two spider heroes that she spent the last hour thinking about it, but she can't. At the end of the day, Valeria is just a kid and if she discovers that her father isn't who he says he is, then, well, that's just too much for a kid to comprehend. Valeria allows them to pass, but they must answer one question to keep her silence. Did you or anyone on your team kill Stephen Strange? Parker replies, no. Of course not. Inside, the heroes found a blinding white room and a man Parker identifies as Owen Reese, the Molecule Man. Reese has information to share, but he is hungry. Unfortunately, Parker doesn't have any food, but wait, Morales does. He brings out a hamburger from his pocket. The sight of a burger causes Reese to salivate. He must have that burger. Parker questions Morales as to how he obtained the burger. Morales states that he got that from home, his home, before the incursion. So that's an 8 year and 3 week old burger? I don't think suspended animation counts. Oh man, I don't think he should be eating that. <laughs> so good. After he devoured the burger, Reese is presented with a question. Where can they find the source of Doom's power? Reese states, Oh yes, you're looking at him. Castle Doom. Meeting after meeting, God Doom grows weary. He now meets with some of his barons. They bring news of a man who caused uprisings throughout Battleworld and known as the Prophet. This man raised an army large enough that entire kingdoms are bending to his will. Apocalypse shares his counsel. Only the strong shall survive. Power structures must be maintained. God Doom is among us. Anyone who say otherwise is an offense. Only the loyal shall live. Kill the rest. Doom agrees with his counsel, but instead of sending in his private police force of Thors, God Doom demands that you, his loyal barons shall tend to this pretender and his mob, for Doom is losing what little grace he still possesses. The meeting adjourns and Baron Sinister returns to speaking to one of the heroes from the 616. Captain Marvel is his guest and the two of them will build an alliance to usurp Doom's throne. The hidden island of Agamotto, T'Challa, and Namor finally arrives at their destination. They brave through the World Sea, the Great Leviathan Horde, and the hidden isle itself to be able to reach Stephen Strange's sanctuary. With the Eye of Agamotto, they gain access through 
Suddenly, the face of Stephen Strange appears, but it's only a sentry. It prepares the death traps to test the ex-kings of Atlantis and Wakanda for being friends or foe. They pass a set of tests, so the sentry offers them two of the most valuable artifacts owned by Stephen Strange. The first one is a Siege Courageous. This object of power can transport them to anywhere they wish to go. The second item is Stephen's most precious possession, an item that might be the only thing on this world that can smite a god. Stephen Strange presents an Infinity Gauntlet. Elsewhere, a young Franklin is tucked into bed by his mother, Susan. He requests for a bedtime story, his favorite story, a story of the Fantastic Four. Susan recalls a time when there were four of them. Her brother, Johnny Storm, their friend, Ben Grimm, her father, Dr. Franklin Storm, and herself. They set on what they thought was going to be an incredible journey, but their ship crashed and they emerged with incredible power. They protected the Earth, but one day, their world ended and this new world began. It was a cruel and dark world. War plagued every corner, but there was hope, a brilliant and blinding light. It was Franklin's father, Victor Von Doom. He made a world from nothing, and he made a world that is everything. Dr. Franklin Storm died before the light's arrival, but Johnny Storm became the sun which brought light onto this wonderful world. And Ben, well Ben Grimm is a story for another day, for when you are older. The story ends and the mother kisses her son goodnight. Elsewhere on the shield. Detention level. The Thing, Ben Grimm, chats with their prisoner, a man found on the wall who calls himself Thanos. The Mad Titan informs Grimm that this world is not what it should be, and that Ben Grimm's service to God Doom is a sham. Where he came from, Grimm is the closest friend of Doom's greatest enemy. Ben has shamed him time and time again. Doom is a petty usurper of powers far grander than himself. Doom convinced Johnny Storm to be the sun, and Ben Grimm to be on the wall. Not for service to the people Doom watches over, but because God fears him. Doom convinced you to live on your knees. He has beaten you as you lay there. The Titan states. Are you just going to die here, or are you going to stand up? With those words, Ben Grimm, the Thing, obliterates the shield, the wall that separates the horrors and nightmares away from Doom's land. Ben Grimm made a decision. He will stand. The prophet appeared from nothing, emerging from the great waste, a cause fully formed, an idea given shape, that doom is no god. The prophet spoke of liberty and freedom, it sparked a fire, monuments were toppled, and the people raised their arms. They marched on Castle Doom to cast out God himself, but who was this great catalyst? His name was Maximus. He led these people to certain doom, and at the end, things are going to be so much fun. As Doom watches over the battle's castle, Black Swan suggests that she join the fray. Victor refuses this offer, as he fears she will lose herself to her anger, much like how Doom would lose control if he fought against the rebels. Sue Storm asks Victor not to take things personally, as this is what free people do when confronted by authority. She's confident this will end no differently than it has before, but Valeria disagrees. This is different. Something more is going on here. Victor agrees with his daughter and summons the Thors. In the battlefield, Maximus cheers on his charges, but is soon overwhelmed by Madeline Pryor's goblin army. This is observed by Mr. Sinister and Captain Marvel, who decide it is time to act. They turn on the goblins, and while they are able to beat Madeline down, Sinister suddenly finds himself decapitated by Holocaust, son of Apocalypse. Doomguard, citadel of the Thors, then appears above the battlefield. But the Thors have broken out into civil war over the words of Jane Foster. Lady Thor calls upon some select members to strike out against Doom, and they charge, devastating Apocalypse's army. Victor watches this and realizes he has been betrayed again. Apocalypse fights these traitors, frustrated over all of this. If he must bow down over Doom, then the traitors can be given no quarter. However, this is not the last betrayal of the day. A helicarrier appears in the sky, with the maestro attacking. He orders an army of hawks to go, and break the world. Meanwhile, Reed Richards, the Maker, and Star-Lord are preparing their end of the plan. 
While Maximus has created a distraction, they will sneak by Doom undetected to steal the most valuable thing in the multiverse. The Maker says that Maximus will not last long against Doom, and it's time for them to unleash their secret plans. Reed contacts T'Challa and tells him to begin his attack. With Namor beside him, the Black Panther creates a hole in the wall, unleashing the Marvel Zombies. The undead are confused. Their skin itches, and they feel compelled to kneel before T'Challa. It turns out the mantle of the King of the Dead isn't just a name, and Black Panther is able to order them to march. Reluctantly, the zombies vow to seek glory and honor, and they prepare to strike. Doomsguard, the battle rages on between Doom's forces and the insurgents. Peter Quill, Reed Richards, and his doppelganger from the parallel Earth are on their way to join the fight, but a Hulk appears out of nowhere and takes out the engines. Elsewhere on the battlefield, the Maestro and his army of Hulks have laid waste to Doom's front lawn. The Maestro looks upon Doom's throne and is ready to take it for himself. But Ben Grimm, the Thing, appears behind the future Hulk. Grimm is on his way towards Doomguard to settle old scores. It appears that something was in his way. Explosions echo throughout Doom's land, but the loud burst caught the attention of the Black Swan. The rebels have reached the castle. Doom commands his loyal swan to take care of it. He now returns his focus towards the battlefront. Terax, the servant of the World Eater, finally found his master, but this isn't the Galactus he knew and worshipped. This is Doom's watchdog. The watchdog takes his mighty boot and crushes Terax, the herald of Galactus. He now turns his attention towards a more worthy foe. We discover that Franklin Storm is the Puppet Master, and his puppet is the World Eater. Franklin taunts Ben Grimm to challenge his mount. Ben obliges. <laughs> Susan is distraught. Her friend Ben has left the wall and is in heated combat with her son, Franklin. She begs Doom to do something, anything, stop this war, put an end to it. But Doom does not move a muscle. Grim was the shield, and if the shield has fallen... Far towards the south, an enormous dust cloud heralds the Annihilation Horde, with Thanos the Mad Titan riding into battle. This is it. This is the signal Doom had anticipated. He is now ready to join the war. God is here. God Doom, Franklin's father is ready and he isn't in a good mood. Franklin harbors the same anger and blasts Ben Grimm in the shoulders. Grimm pauses for a brief second. He now understands that Franklin is Doom's son. That can only mean one thing. Franklin is Susan's kid. Ben lets his guard down. He will not strike the boy. And he tells the son of God to do what he gotta do. Susan is devastated by the destruction of her home and her friend Ben. But her daughter, Valeria, does not share the same feeling. It's some show, Valeria states. The spectacle of it. Like theater. The daughter turns towards the mother. Do you love me more than anything, no matter what? Susan says what any mother would say. Yes, of course she does. Then come with me, the daughter states. Elsewhere, Peter Quill is hard at work trying to get his ship to be functional again, but the Black Swan makes her appearance. Quill's idle threat does not sway her as the Black Swan destroys the floor, forcing Star-Lord to plummet towards the floor below. Quill's spleen is broken, and he is probably bleeding eternally, but he covets a toothpick he brought from the 616. Quill continues to threaten the Swan, but this time, his pick is the weapon of choice. Fool, the Swan states. You are bleeding on my god throne, little man. Time to die. Say hello to my little friend. Wait for it. Wait for it. I... I... I am good! Valeria and Susan ran from their crumbling home. The world tree just gained sentience and is now walking away. Valeria explains to her mother that they have been lied to. Doom isn't a god. She takes Susan towards the source of God Doom's power, only to find that someone else is already there. Valeria! <laughs> I guess I shouldn't be so surprised. Hello, Susan. 
doom stands between his land and the raging horde of annihilation. Thanos presents himself. The two tyrannical gods stand face to face. Doom begins with offering a large piece of land and appointing Thanos as one of his new barons. But Thanos declines. The Mad Titan was once a god as well, when he wielded the Infinity Gauntlet. Doom is a weak god, a pretender. Doom should bow before Thanos. And do you have an Infinity Gauntlet now? Doom states. God himself reaches deep and pulls out the bones of the Mad Titan. God made a judgment and another foe has been judged. God now turns towards Nihilus. With Thanos gone, Nihilus bends the knee. Doom is owed penance for this indulgence and now, he demands for his renewed servant to turn the Annihilation Wave towards those who would seek to usurp Doom's throne. Elsewhere in the battlefield, the war rages on and bodies are starting to pile, but suddenly a doorway opens up and even God himself is shocked. The zombies have arrived at last with their new leader. Victor! Your reign is over! And it ends with us! Everything dies. You, me, everyone on this planet. Our sun, our galaxy, and eventually, the universe itself. This is simply how things are. It is inevitable. And I accept it. So this is how it is. All this chaos has been orchestrated by the Black Panther and Namor. Doom is furious, but they don't care, and say goodbye to God. With the power of the Infinity Gauntlet, they turn Victor into glass and shatter him. But it can't be that easy. It won't be. And though it did hurt Doom, he reforms and blasts them with a tremendous wave of energy. T'Challa is able to block the blast with his gauntlet, but Namor is gone. Doom is now giving the Black Panther his full attention. It is time for them to battle as gods. On the earth, in the sky, and the heavens above. In Doom's castle, Sue and Valeria confront the two Reed Richards. Sue only recognizes them through an image of when Reed and his people murdered Doctor Strange. Reed is devastated to hear that she really just knows him through this, and explains this was all Doom's work. Victor is a killer and a fraud, and Reed is here to fix things. As the Panther God clashes with the God of Doom, Reed enters the Molecule Man's realm with the Maker. As the two versions of Reed Richards look on at the source of Doom's power, Reed asks how Owen Reese is doing. The man is still starving, but Reed Richards' ultimate counterpart doesn't care. Using a device he cobbled together, he regresses Reed into the form of an ape. He would be sorry for this betrayal, but he just saw how he almost cried at the sight of Sue Storm. And who would want to weep in God? Owen says he would, and that he's hungry for some pizza. In an instance, the Maker is sliced into pieces and devoured alive. Owen returns Reed to normal and says that Richards needs to pull himself together. He's going to be here soon. Outside, Doom has finally managed to overpower T'Challa. He beats the man down, and Victor declares himself the superior being. But something is wrong. The Black Panther is smiling. All of this chaos was indeed orchestrated, but even T'Challa was a distraction. Doom teleports back to his castle, where he is confronted by Sue. When she asks about Stephen Strange, Doom only says he is sorry, and that he tried. Inside Owen's home, Doom confronts his rival, truly outraged at this madness. He had to meddle, didn't he? They saved millions, while Reed only saved himself. And it's time to die. Doom realizes something is wrong, 
and Owen says that Doom didn't bring him any food, just like Reed. That makes the two of them equal, doesn't it? So the two men begin a savage fight to the death. Victor is exasperated at all of this. He asks if Reed thinks any of this was easy. He was given impossible choices and did the best he could given these options. But Reed knows better. Victor erased his entire life just to indulge the man's own whims. He stole Reed's family. He closed his hands around everything left in reality and called it his own, and he held it too tight. Victor is astonished at these words and accuses Reed of genuinely believing that he could have done better with all of this power. Reed affirms that he could have, he would have, and they both know it. Doom admits this is true, and Owen says, well, if they both agree. Vitala activates the Infinity Gauntlet, and everything goes white. He wakes up, home. Astonished that it worked, he looks on as his people are mapping another solar system. He congratulates the men. The West has abandoned their space program, but where they flounder, Wakanda excels. They dare to dream bigger, and their prize is the stars themselves. Owen Reese The man was so grateful for that burger. Owen said he would repay that boy. Peter Parker greets his companion. He asks if Miles ate a snack and did his homework, and Morales confirms that he has. So Peter says it's time to beat up some bad guys. They swing out into New York City. At the edge of all that is, the Future Foundation is gathered. Owen Reese has a new guide for all his power. With Reed's instructions and Franklin Richards' formidable abilities, they have rebuilt the multiverse, one universe at a time. Each universe is tethered by a version of Molecule Man, and by splitting himself apart, Owen becomes better and more whole. He's healed. But that's just the start of everything. These realms of reality will need to be cataloged and explored. The Future Foundation is ready and willing to do this, together. Sue finds her husband and tells him that this really is something. Franklin asks if they aren't superheroes anymore, and Reed says that for now, they are a family of scientists and explorers. For now, that is good enough. As their son leaves, the couple talks about Ben and Johnny, and how they will miss them, but their story isn't over. Those two have more to do back home. Sue looks on at all of reality around them, and says that as superheroes, it was a pretty amazing final act to save all that is. Reed says that he learned the difference between living and dying is managing fear, not being so afraid of losing the things you love that you hold them too tight. He used to believe in entropy, that all things must die, but he changed his mind, he's letting go. Because now he believes in expansion, he believes in endurance. You, me, everyone on this planet, our sun, our galaxy, and the universe itself. This is simply how things are. Everything lives. It all started with two men. One was death, and one was life. Hello and welcome to Comic Island. My name is Arden, and this is our mega video of Time Runs Out and Secret Wars. So with Secret Wars at long last wrapped up, I thought it would be fun to combine the entire event into one big story. And I hope you guys liked it. This was a fun excursion for us, featuring years worth of comics and telling this big, epic tale within Marvel Comics. While I have talked at length about both of these stories, to review, I do think there is something special here. Is this the greatest story of all time? <laughs> no, not really, but I have to give props to Marvel for going full tilt with it. If you're gonna go big, you need to commit, and they sure showed a lot of commitment with this story. Never walking it back and demonstrating a strong sense of confidence with every issue. I admire that, and though I understand it's not for everybody, or nor was everyone on board at this story, I sure was. It felt like this important, mighty tale that never pulled any punches. The art was great, especially during certain segments of Time Runs Out, and overall it was a decently polished story. Characters like Reed Richards, Iron Man, and Captain America shine as they are forced to face oblivion, and each character reacts to the end of reality in their own way. It's interesting, and practically philosophical, to see the characters internally and externally debate the merits of survival versus morality. 
and I think both sides of the equation had their sense of being morally right. Yes, survival is really all that matters, but I think Captain America was right about how we survive and the merits of that too. Iron Man and the others were never really given a choice, it was always us or them. But when you're talking about it destroying entire worlds, well, it's hard to take the moral high ground, especially knowing that they're basically just staving off the inevitable while killing innocent people in the process. So there's a real thought behind this story, despite what anyone might say, and then, to top everything off, it just might be one of the best Doctor Doom stories ever. In my eyes, Victor is the absolute star of this story. Secret Wars cements Doom as one of the biggest, baddest forces in all of Marvel and the comic book world in general, and it was so fun to see it all unfold. So yeah, I recommend you check out these comics for yourself. It's tough to find all the issues, as there isn't really a master collection of these comics, as far as I know. But I do think it is worth getting your hands on what you can find. Because the story was an experience unlike any other, and I'm very glad to have read it for myself and shared it with you guys here today. Let me know what you think in the comments section below, and thanks for watching! Good for you for making it this far, because yes, this is quite the experience, clocking in at the length of a full movie, so I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and thanks for putting up with it! <laughs> Finally, don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics!